Welcome to the Stronger for Business podcast with Diffrig Jenkins, Pete Rushma, and myself, Bev Thurgood. Stronger for Business is a training consortium dedicated to bringing high quality training solutions to businesses through the combined expertise of our partners. From skills training to developing personal and professional excellence, our mission is to help business owners get the very best from their people at all levels, from boardroom to shop floor. The Stronger for Business podcast is our opportunity to share our knowledge, thoughts and ideas with you, the listener. You'll get to meet some awesome guests from across the business world, sharing their experience of learning and development. If you love what we have to say, Make sure you hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you use to consume your podcasts so you don't miss out on future episodes. We'd love to hear from you with your suggestions for discussion topics or ideas for future guests. And if you really love what you hear, please do consider leaving us a five-star review as this helps to get the podcast out to a wider audience. Sit back and enjoy the Stronger for Business podcast. Welcome to episode two of the S4B podcast. I don't know where that time has gone. So episode one was all about introducing us. This is episode two. We get into the real good stuff from now on. So I'm sat, sat here again with uh, with my two co-presenters. We've got Devrig there and Pete. Uh, say hi, guys. Hello. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? You can tell who's who because Pete's got the English accent and Dave, you've got the Welsh accent. So if you're listening to this rather than watching it, mine's fairly straightforward. You can pick up the high-pitched Geordie, but just so you know who the two guys are. So we're going to be talking about um, collaboration, aren't we? It's very exciting. Okay. Looking, forward to, looking forward to today's topic. Yeah, brilliant. Before we get going then, let's have a bit of a, a review. What have you been up to this last week? Pete, tell me what you've been up to. Oh, well, Friday, Friday, we, we took full advantage of the Zoom situation at the moment and being in isolation. And uh, I managed to successfully complete uh, a quiz for our family who range from all over the UK, but also into Dubai as well. Uh, we'd, we'd actually had to rain check it literally from the week before because we'd got two rounds into a 10 round quiz and my daughter spilled a pint of water over my laptop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, it was quite stressful. It was really quite stressful, but we were able to make sure this Friday there were no cables around. There was nothing for her to trip on. We made sure we did a full hazard awareness and uh, you know, there was a full assessment in place. So yeah, we managed to overcome that. So yeah, super, super happy to have done that. And it was quite good fun actually. Um, and then, and then, sort of in other news, uh, I'm really, really pleased that I set a goal a few weeks ago to to, to cut down my 10 kilometer run time uh, by 10 percent. And I did a run two or three weeks ago for 10k, and I really, really struggled. It took me 75 minutes. And uh, on Sunday, I did another 10k at 63 minutes. And by my reckoning, that's slightly more than 10%. So I was super happy with that. Uh, that's fantastic. Do you know, isn't that, isn't that really motivating though, when you can see those changes happening? Yeah, and it, it just felt, re- it felt really good actually. It felt really good and I paced myself well and I had a strong finish. So I was, yeah, I was, I was really, really pleased with it. And it made a big difference. When I've trained running previously, I've often just set a goal to finish and just to complete the distance rather than to set a time. Um, But I've become much more goal orientated as a, as a person from a professional development point of view, setting goals for everything and the the reward actually, and actually having that target and having something to aim at from a time point of view makes it makes a big, big difference from how rewarding it is, but also how that pushed me on and made me perform better. So yeah, interesting topic maybe for another day. Absolutely, goal set and I can't beat it. Brilliant. Oh, well done. Well, that's Thank brilliant. I, I managed to get out for a four mile walk on Saturday, and then on Sunday, I went out for a more four mile run walk because my running is way out the window. Do you know, it was only 2011 I did, um, I did the Great North Run, 
um, and loved it. I've done a couple of half marathons, never managed a, a full marathon. Um, yeah. And it's only probably two years ago that I was quite comfortably running four or five miles. And now I really struggle to walk four miles, let alone running. Yeah. But I was quite chuffed that I even got a bit of running in. And it was hot as well on Saturday. Yeah, really hot. It's been a lovely weekend. But it's um, running, running is one of those really challenging things where you, you it takes a long time to build up and then very little time just to it's deteriorate easy. the ability. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Right. You've got, got to stay in with it. Yeah, it doesn't help because my husband's um, a runner. He ran for the RAF, ran, you know, he's run all mm. his life. He ran competitively. Yeah. So whereas I run probably around about 10 to 11 miles, uh, minute miles, he's like, even at 57, he's still like six minutes, seven minute miling. And they just yeah. faced, he was like five and a half minute miles. I think, oh my God, you know, it's not fair, is it? It's not something yeah. we could have ever done together because he was too quick. What about you, Dove? What have you been up to this week? Well, I had a similar goal to suit Pete, actually, where he wanted to cut his run time down. I did that. So for a couple of weeks before I was running 3K, um, I cut that down to zero. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do any running at all because I've never, I've never been a runner. If I go to the gym, um, I run on the treadmill. But road running is <clears throat> it's really different, isn't it? Because you haven't got the give and, and the treadmill and, and lots of other excuses. So, so I did that. But I, I did do... Um, Joe works every morning last week. Uh, so at eight o'clock every morning before I started work, uh, my wife and I, uh, we did uh, Joe Wicks for the 20 minutes hit. And God, that was hard work. It's, it's good, but it's good, you know, because like Pete and yourself said, you know, you need a goal, you need somebody to, you need to be self motivated, but you, you need somebody else yeah. to, to push you um, as well. So, so, so that was good and felt a lot better for it. Um, my recovery time was better than I thought it was going to be. Um, it's like everything that you have to learn, isn't it? You just, mm -hmm. it's, it's never easy and you, and you have to push yourself. Yeah, so, so we did that. Uh, we took a day off today because it's my daughter's birthday today. Um, so, uh, so there's no homeschooling today. Uh, I know Joe works, but normal service resumes tomorrow. Um, yeah, so out, out and about. Uh, went on a 15, 20 mile bike ride yesterday as well. So uh, yes, enjoying the sunshine because I think weather's going to change from tomorrow, I think. So uh, yeah, make the most of it. Like everything in life, make the most of it while you can. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Um, well, I'm really, I feel quite privileged that you're here with us recording the podcast when it's your daughter's birthday. She really doesn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know, the height of my day so far has been that our fridge freezer, well, the freezer, actually, we've got a separate freezer, um, has decided it's not going to play properly. So it's tripped the electricity out, out three times today. So bearing in mind that I'm hosting the uh, the zoom meeting here if i suddenly disappear it will blame it on the freezer <laughs> i actually thought it was about to happen then you took it, your internet must have just popped then and it went like that just for a second and uh, i thought it was going <laughs> what was that what on earth was that noise there's a siren somewhere i thought it was I heard, something I heard your a houses. siren but it's, it's it's not near me i live in hampton don't you know <laughs> zero crime well, it must have been an online siren because we all heard it. Yeah, it's not in my it? house. We're miles yours? apart. <laughs> wow, how bizarre! We well, go. that Maybe is weird. Coming to get one of us. <laughs> anyway, let's get let's get back to the uh, <laughs> let's get back to the podcast. That was bizarre. Um, we might not edit that out. We might just leave that in. Um, oh, exciting stuff! Let's chat about collaboration then, because that's what we're doing. Um, but I think it might be good to talk about the benefits of collaboration in learning and also the benefits of, benefits of collaboration for business. So let's go. Let's talk. So I'll, I'll, I'll just kick it off with the collaboration in learning. So quite recently, I personally experienced just a little while since I, I went on sort of any training per se myself um with a with a group of individuals i've done quite a bit online um and i've done a lot of personal stuff however uh, i've recently joined a book club and wow the the collaborative learning out of a book club absolutely incredible it may it's made such a difference we're we're reading various professional development books um this week this month was you ask they answer and as a group we then review them after everyone's read and the the different perspectives and points of view on a, on a book alone uh, and the different interpretations and the different meanings it's really really expanded my mind and really really opened up my thoughts to the benefits of collaborative learning 
it's a really interesting one, isn't it? As a trainer, I, you know, the, there's the, the stand at the front and the talk and talk, you know, you lecture almost people. And, the, and, and when, you, when you're delivering sort of teaching, I, I don't even call that training, but when you're delivering information in that sort of chalk and talk style, it really is just a one-way process, isn't it? You're, it's dull. It's awful. It is dull. <laughs> yeah. But you're, you're teaching, but you have absolutely no understanding or no way of knowing if that learning is actually being received. Because, of course, I can go in and teach, but I can't force somebody to learn. Mm-hmm. That, that's no. a, huge, a huge difference. So for me, from a training point of view, I do a lot of group work. I do a mm-hmm. lot of posing questions and getting the group to answer the question because unlike you know your GCSEs or O levels as it was in my day don't laugh either of you um, I had them too (laughs) did you I thought I was the last of the O levels Um, oh I'm clearly the baby then you are you are (laughs) only just (laughs) behave Um, but yeah unlike sort of that kind of academic learning where you're learning facts and you're learning figures are you le- you're just learning knowledge that that to me isn't that that's just information storage mm-hmm. it's not learning i've got a friend who um i would say he's a pretty smart guy he's got a couple of master's degrees he's got about three or four bachelor degrees you know i mean learning is his thing but he can't drive a car and he can't do anything practical uh, he, he, he cooks, but that's about the, the limit of his sort of practical skills. And to me, learning is about applying. Mm. And as a, a trainer, if I just deliver information, I have no way of knowing if the people that I'm delivering that information to are going to be able to apply any of the stuff that I've delivered. So mm. to me, collaborative learning, when you put people in into groups or they can they can share their learning experiences, gives me as a trainer great feedback as to whether what I'm delivering is being absorbed and and put to practical use, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And I think for for a lot of us that um, are or were trainers, I think you start off with with the technical skills. A lot of people come into training or L&D through the um, technical competence, whatever that might be. You kind of asked, oh, <clears throat> I think it'll be good training that. Why don't you go and give it a go? So you give it a go. Um, and a lot of it is usually comes out of manuals or textbooks or processes or, or something like that. Um, and then as you develop your skills um, and you get older and you have more experience, um, that turns then into, into more of a facilitation rather than standing at the front with PowerPoint or before my time, you know, of overhead projectors, you know, all those kind of things. Um, and, and just talking at people, and, and I think a lot of people, and even though life has moved on so much and technology has moved so much, there are still a lot of people out there talking at people. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Is that you, you, you have uh, some content, whatever that might be, whatever your discipline or your industry or whatever the topic is, um, and actually to pose a question and they, you know, get people to talk about it in their context. Um, and actually, you know, as, as a coach as well, you... you uh, you know that using coaching skills, you can have a conversation with people, and if you pose the right question in the right way, given the context, the answers are nearly always in the room. But you're providing a framework with some theory or some research to help support that. Um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's just really interesting that uh, the collaborative learning. You know, don't feel you know as as a trainer, especially if there are new trainers uh, or people interested in training. Um, you know, if if you're thinking about standing and talking at people for a whole day or half a day or an hour, it's really, really not going to work um, because I think pe- people's learning styles, um, I think we'll probably talk about that in a different podcast, uh, that, that doesn't always work for people. Um, and, um, yeah, so it's, it's allowing the group to talk more than you do as the trainer, but as a, as a facilitator, you're there to facilitate learning uh, rather than to, uh, to lecture at people. People have that in school, and like you said earlier, uh, Bev, uh, knowledge retention is is so small. You know, if you spend a whole day learning, um, then the chances are you're going to walk away from that day not remembering much at all. Mm. Certainly after twelve hours, twenty four hours, you, you, after a, a month, you're not going to even remember that you weren't on that training course. Maybe let alone actually what you learned. So, collaborative learning 
in a learning space, but outside that learning space, especially like Pete said, something like a book club or a virtual book club, um, and allowing people to have a discussion, challenge ideas, challenge thoughts. Uh, collaborative learning is, is probably more effective and more sustainable um, and transferable as, as well. Is there a space where non-collaborative learning, that more sort of lecture style learning is appropriate, where it would be more beneficial than uh, a more interactive way of learning? Yeah, I, th I think so. You know, if you want to get some insight from, from an expert, um, I've, I've been to um, some sessions in, in London where you go see uh, an, an expert. I remember going to see something, um, I think it was with the London Business Forum, it was called. Um, and the uh, lady who was there was the HR director for the London Olympics. Um, and she gave a presentation for an hour, hour and a half, massively insightful. And if you can imagine going from zero staff to literally tens of thousands of staff and, and, and games helpers at the time, you know, just seeing the, the curve of zero employees, nothing, nothing for ages. A couple of weeks before, it went up by tens of thousands <laughs> and then it dropped away again. You know, if you want that kind of insight, um, lectures and things like that are really important. But you come away from that thinking, yes, that was insightful, that was helpful. Is it really going to benefit me? Probably not. But, but it's, it's good to be inspired and, and to get a little a nugget of information sometimes. But you have to think about the, the long-term benefit, I guess, mm. of, of all kinds of development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I enjoy listening to TEDx talks and uh, various individual learning opportunities like that where, where we can listen to experts speak and I find it fascinating to to watch and listen and learn from people in that way. Uh, I've, I've got a fairly unique perspective on certainly collaborative and and learning and, and facilitation as a, a as a training skill. So that that's very much what what our business is based on. So entering into initially the driver CPC training market, where it's mandatory training, the classes have to be seven hours seven hours delivered training uh, as per the EU directive and every driver has to sit five in five years so therefore they have to sit 35 hours worth of training um, for me to come in from a facilitation background I find I find that perspective on learning quite challenging um, and and that actually I've, I've kind of found the best of both worlds uh, in, in that sense from a mandatory training point of view because you know, I've sat on CPC courses myself with 300 slides over seven hours where, where, where it's literally death by PowerPoint. But I've been able to turn that on its head and turn that into a sort of our USP around our hashtag notional guarantee around facilitation. One, one of my seven hour courses has got 13 PowerPoint slides. And yeah. it's all down to the way I've structured that day you know, facilitating learning, group learning, different activities, catering, like, like Diffrig uh, earlier mentioned around different learning styles, catering to different learning styles and ensuring that everyone sort of gets, gets a benefit, benefit from that training. And I loved what you were saying earlier about knowledge and power, because one of my favorite sayings is a lot of people say knowledge is power, but knowledge is only potential power. The power is actually in the application of yeah. the knowledge. And it's, it's so true. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, when you're talking about mandatory training, uh, from a public sector background, I worked for the Air Force for a lot of years, and we had, oh God, hours of mandatory training that we had to mm. go through on health and safety, fire safety, aircraft safety, uh, what they called FOD, foreign object, um, uh, damage awareness. So mm. there was like pounding, pounding amounts of, of mandatory training. But is it really learning? It's ticking a box to say that we've covered our backs to give you this information, but there's no guarantee. You know, if you ask me about any of the mandatory training that I've had to do, could I probably tell you much of it? I don't think so. And yeah, I had no. that every year. We no. had this, you know, the, the, the refresher training. So I suppose the ob we've got to look at the objective. If, if the objective is just to tick a box and cover ourselves from a litigation point of view, then yeah, talk, talk and talk, just, you know, dozens of PowerPoint slides. Yeah. You've had the information, that's my back covered, uh, but that's not learning. That is not learning. Mm -hmm. So why do we do it? Why on earth do we bother going through that process? That's, 
a, you know, it used to be a day out of my life that I was never going to get back every year listening to the same old, same old information um, that I'd forgotten the minute I walked out the door. Why mm. on earth do organisations still do this? Yeah, and, and it's, still, it's, still, it's still there now. The, 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 the measurable of time and time spent in a classroom being the measurable factor. So even first aid training that we deliver, which is fantastic because it is a group activity. It's practical. People get to get off their chairs and get involved in the practical classes. But still, we, we are bound as trainers to achieve a six-hour course. Now, some groups... We, and that, that presents a challenge because sometimes we might be training 12 people, in which case six hours may, may not be enough time for everyone to have a good opportunity. Whereas actually when we run smaller classes, that the, the, the time can reduce quite significantly. So mm -hmm. then you find that you're covering additional ground. Well, those learners are getting more benefit than the bigger class learners, but ultimately we're bound by this time measurement. And I do find that interesting. It'd be fantastic to be able to sit down with um, the resource council and say, look, you know, why are we measuring learning by, by time still and not learning outcomes and not, you know, we, mm -hmm. our, our classes still end with a multiple choice test and to demonstrate learning. And actually the pass and fail is ultimately down to the ability to complete the practical tasks, especially with first aid, well, particularly with first aid. Um, so I, I do find it baffling that whilst we learners need to pass a test and to pass practical skills, we're still bound by we're still bound by the timing. And actually, I wonder is that is it because it's a benefit to the learner, or is it actually a way of policing training companies? to ensure that they're delivering delivering the course that they're meant to deliver, which, are, you know, I find, I find quite interesting as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, um, so from a corporate background, so in, in one of my previous roles um, in financial services and insurance, the, the induction for most people going into a contact centre environment could be three or four weeks. Um, and it's really, really intense. You know, you've got to learn how to use the phones, the software, there's scripting or guidance, depending on which company with the language that we kind of use. There's all the FCA rules, uh, Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, there's all the uh, quality and compliance uh, measures, which essentially come from the FCA, but then get interpreted into each organization. There's all the brands that they work for, the different customer types. <clears throat> and it's a lot of information. It's really interesting, Pete, what you're saying is, yes, there are the rules. There's the, the, the guidance and the law um, often. But then it's the misinterpretation um, of, of operational teams, of quality of compliance, of the training team often, to say that we have to do all of this and we're kind of force feeding information down and nobody's going to learn anything in three weeks. They might learn it for a couple of days and they've forgotten it. And then you're on to the next thing and then on to the next thing and you have three weeks of intensive training and then people, or four weeks, and then people come out to that and they go, I don't remember what I did on Friday, let alone three Fridays ago, let alone my first day, which is nearly a month ago, and then people fail so often by force feeding people and not allowing people to practice and to collaborate and talk and have discussions, which is why we're having this conversation about collaborative learning. Um, you know, we are setting people up to fail. Um, anyway, if you even go back to health and safety perspective, you, know, you can dress health and safety up as much as you want to. You can, make, you can gamify uh, e-learning and all that kind of stuff, but it is what it is, get it done, get over and done quickly, but then make sure that people understand that and maybe have the practical opportunity to do that. So you know, there's, there's lots of arguments uh, for and against uh, blended learning, you know, but why spend three hours gamifying health and safety or some kind of compliance? Get it done as quickly as possible because nobody wants to do it. They have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then do something practical where people can actually learn about lifting or where the fire escapes are or, or whatever, whatever it might be. So yeah, it's, but it's getting that balance, you know, so for over the three, if it's an eight hour first aid training, you know, do actually what, what people have to do, but then allow some, some give in there. I think people yeah. and organizations and legal entities uh, can be too fixated um, on um, what people have to do and force feeding. Well, actually, you, what we are setting people up to fail and that can be dangerous um, in some respects mm. yeah there's that absolutely. old saying isn't there um show me and I, uh, tell me and i forget show me and i remember involve me and i understand and surely mm. when we get to learning we want to get to the point of understanding not just knowing um absolutely. We, we've got to go that that 
bit deeper. I, know, I think Confucius said that probably about 3,000 years ago or something like that. We still haven't learned. So. No, I didn't hear that firsthand, though. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not no, quite that absolutely. old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think there's certain times when you don't need to have collaborative learning. If you're doing direct skills training, um, you're, you're showing somebody how to do something, you're showing them, they're having a go while you supervise them, um, and you've got that kind of skill at the end of it. You can measure whether that learning has happened because there's a product at the end of it that shows that it has, and maybe you repeat that you know, a few dozen times until it, 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 we go through the whole um, unconscious incompetence right through to unconscious competence still absolutely but i think if we're talking about behavior change if we're talking about perspective change if we're talking about a change in thinking we can't do talk and chalk and expect to get that level of absolutely uh, a, a level of change and transformation mm -hmm. yeah i couldn't agree more um if if i was to ask if i was asked to come in and do something to stand in front of a group of people for unless it was mandatory compliance training um I, I probably would turn that down turn down that kind of work uh, because it's not my style and i don't think uh, the organization would be getting the value out of me mm -hmm. um, and i don't and they wouldn't get the return on investment um, so as a provider if i was asked to do that i would have a very honest conversation uh, with that uh, with that sponsor of that company and say i don't think this is the best approach can we discuss a better way mm -hmm. Yeah. But sometimes people don't know what they don't know. So I, I think it's as providers to, to help people uh, get the best out of us um, yeah, and absolutely. get the return on their investment. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a layering here, isn't there? So a lot of what I do is awareness training. So mm -hmm. specifically around menopause, as you know, um, I go in and I talk to organizations and their, their employees about menopause. And a lot of the work that I do is at that awareness level. It's not necessarily looking for behavior change. There's, a, you know, there's a lot of people they want to make aware of the issues around menopause, but actually knowing the issues isn't necessarily going to change the way people are, but it's a starting point. And I think that's, that's important as well. We, we, we talk about awareness. I, I suppose it's that, that whole, you know, tell me and I, I forget, show me and I, I remember. Um, involve me. So the involve is the next stage after awareness, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that I've found is that, you know, I go in and talk to management team or manage, managers in particular. Um, and I, I will go in and do an awareness session with managers and I walk away and I think, I really wish I could follow this up with, so, okay, so this is the information you've had. Now let's, let's do a few sessions about how you can actually practically apply mm -hmm. Yeah. this so how can you have those awkward conversations let's discuss that in more detail um, and it's often hard to get organizations to realize that the awareness training in any topic or subject is just the first stage it's not mm -hmm. going to be enough to to create that behavior change in you know further down the line yeah, absolutely. There, there, there's no way. There's no way that change. There's no way that change will happen off the back of a, a training course or a learning and development day. Uh, there, there, there's no way that change can happen. Change happens over time, um, and and then we, we, you know, we're talking about the importance of having a mentor and uh, coaching and facilitation in in the workplace and in the environment following any training to ensure that learning's been embedded. Um, I think I think that's a, a massive, importantly part get my words out properly <laughs> uh, it's a massively important part of the learning process is to actually go back into the uh, the workplace and to ensure that you have a mentor you know because that, that, that's absolutely the way that change occurs and, and behavioral change happens mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, i think sometimes but though it's hard to get that there's a lot of beeping going on in the background i think sometimes it's hard to um get that across to businesses especially you know when they're when they're investing money in this um mm -hmm. they they want to hit as 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 great a number of people as they can um at the lowest cost which is you know makes sense but if you're paying lip service to the process you're kind of wasting your money if there's yeah, no absolutely. follow up mm -hmm. so well i try to encourage the through <clears throat> so if it is a program um 
what I try uh, always to do is to make sure that there is, like Pete said, a, a, a mentor. Um, so somebody to hold learners, individuals. Uh, so that could be the line manager. So a line manager could have one person or several people um, on a program from their team on their teams. So it's making sure that the, the line manager uh, or the sponsors are fully aware, sometimes in advance uh, of what's going on so that they understand they can support and challenge their people. But also as well, having peers being able to support and challenge each other as well, especially you know, if, if an organization uh, doesn't really know much about or doesn't implement coaching or mentoring as well. So if you start saying maybe, I want you to coach somebody, I want you to mentor somebody, thinking, oh, God, there's something else I need to learn about um, as well. So it's just making sure that the people are supporting and challenging each other be between the sessions. Um, you know, so if there's one session a month, making sure that people um, are being held to, to account, for the want of a better word, mm -hmm. because we're, we're all grown-ups, to make sure that that collaboration and that learning stays alive for the three, four, five, six weeks, whatever it might be between, between sessions as well. And it's really interesting that when you have the conversations, when you meet up with people, it's gone, oh yeah, uh, we had a conversation about this and we've been talking to each other nationally because, uh, and the collaboration sometimes happens between sites. Oh, yeah. And then you get lots of additional learning, not just about the topic that you learned, but learning about each other and each other's departments and each other's sites and all the cultural nuances and stuff called mm -hmm. as well. So collaborative learning from a, particularly from a management and leadership perspective, has so many additional benefits, not only uh, what you talk about um, as, a, as a topic. Uh, yeah. on a particular day yeah. or half day yeah one thing that i sort of picked up on that i wanted to sort of address as well is that yes it you know having your manager's involvement in the learning process is about holding the learner to account but it's also about recognizing the value that you place in that um mm -hmm. in that member's um staff or that colleague so that they, they there's a value in them putting in the time let's face it learning something new takes effort it takes Absolutely, time, it yeah. takes yeah. effort, and it takes mm -hmm. um, commitment. So if there's a detachment between the student and the manager, then the, the, there's potentially a feeling of, I'm in this on my own, why am I putting mm -hmm. all this effort in, and it's not even being recognized. So I think it's, mm -hmm. it is about holding the learner to account, but it's also about um, showing the value that you place in that employee mm -hmm. um, and through the support that you've given them to develop and I think yeah. that's often missed. Let's look, if we can, at the broader value of collaboration. Now, obviously, as a consortium, collaboration is at the heart of what we do. Um, so let's talk about some of the benefits of collaborating not within an organization, because obviously we've brought three separate organizations together. It might not necessarily be that there's three external agencies coming together. It could be collaboration between different departments, between different teams. What are the benefits? You hear homeschool in the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least that's demonstration that homeschool is happening in our household. Okay. So um, <laughs> going, going back to your point uh, regarding uh, collaboration within an organisation, I find I've, I've certainly found in my previous life in corporate in, in corporate businesses that there is a real challenge around silos and breaking silos down um particularly uh well in, in pretty much every business that i've worked in and every type of business there's always been a challenge between departments and there's been some friction and and interestingly certainly in a privately owned business the the, the business owner had put in place bonus schemes that almost caused friction as well between departments and that you know that lack of collaboration was quite damaging and i think the the bonus scheme had been done inadvertently because he, he'd looked at each function individually um, and he'd looked at that function and thought how can i get this function working most productively most proactively and most profitably but hadn't considered the impact for the overall business from that function mm -hmm. and therefore that had created this this sort of friction and, uh, and, and and that's interesting and actually businesses need to take a much more holistic approach across departments mm -hmm. so that they can work out a great way for them all to collaborate yeah i think performance yeah. bonuses do that as do key performance indicators sometimes mm -hmm. the kpis in each different department actually create priorities that conflict and, and create conflict um, in the in the wider organization mm. um, okay Dev, any thoughts yeah 
Yeah, I agree with everything that, that you guys have just said. Um, and it's really interesting when you talk about collaboration, you think, and it sounds like such a nice thing to have. And I hate to use the word nice. Who should all collaborate? You know, it's, as one of my old line managers says, it's common sense, but it's never common practice. And, you know, if you go to a medium-sized business or, you know, a large size or, you know, a multinational corporate, I've, I've seen it and experienced it as well, where everything from the organizational design, if you like, um, com completely goes against the overall strategy of the business. And you look at it again, this just does not make any sense. So you get an overall business strategy, you get all the goals, all the things that follow to that. And then some of the, and you know, the, the intention is right, but the application of it is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. You get five different business areas, you know, whatever they might be, you give them the KPIs and the targets, and they actively then work against each other. So it's really interesting that just by the structure and the design of the organization, organization it works counter to collaboration. Mm -hmm. So therefore, communication falls apart. And then like Pete says, people are competing rather than collaborating. Silos are then formed and then, and then those other silos don't actually exist unless you're on a farm. <laughs> so, you know, and then all of a sudden all these walls go up between people and then there's mistrust. And then teamwork falls apart and all of a sudden you have a very dysfunctional organization yeah. rather than something that actually, why are we competing when we should be collaborating? Because everything that we do in an organization, no matter how big or small it is, should be there to deliver the overall business strategy and, and the objectives mm -hmm. and, and work within a, a, a hopefully, a common set of values as well. It's really interesting that human nature is uh, works um, against what we should be doing often. Mm. And, and yet, as as humans, we are naturally collaborative. We we want yes. to work together. We mm -hmm. we prefer interdependency to independence. Really, um, certainly, yeah. certainly it just doesn't um, make sense, does it? It doesn't. I suppose if you're looking at businesses and organisations as you know, metaphorically like a machine, as we have mm -hmm. done in, in in for many years. We're looking at different functions having specific roles. So if something isn't working properly, you assume that one element of that machine must be broken. Mm -hmm. Whereas I don't know that, that the complexity of business really fits that metaphor very well. I think the idea of, um, uh, of business as being more organic, of being more of a, an ecosystem where, mm -hmm. you know, if, if something isn't working, it, it's possibly just that, you know, we need to look at the, the organization as a whole and see where those different parts are working together and supporting mm -hmm. each other from a, a, a more sort of ecological point of view, if you like. So it's really funny you should say that because um, I honestly haven't prepped this already. This, this book, uh, Pete just talking about book clubs earlier, and I'm not in a book club, but people share, oh, have you read this book? So this is called Black Box Thinking, and I think a lot of people great might have book. read this already. Yes, I've great not read book. it. I've um, heard of it, yeah. not read it. Oh, I recommend it book. to you. Yeah, uh, so, so this is really cool. And it's really interesting that um, often because of mistrust and silos and blame and things like that, <clears throat> there's usually something wrong with one department or one person is then doing their job. There's an example in there of a, um, of a lean process in a, um, in a car manufacturer. Um, and if anybody knows anything about lean processes and car manufacturers, uh, they probably know who it is. And if something is wrong with the, um, with the process, um, and on the shop floor on the production line and something isn't wrong so a door isn't fitting properly or a component part isn't right the whole thing gets shut down and all the senior managers come together and say what's what can we learn from this what's gone wrong because it's not one person one department's fault it's probably everybody's had something to do with that so mm -hmm. it's a very very different way of thinking rather than going well that's your fault you haven't done your job yeah, mm. and, and you get the mistrust and a blame culture then often comes around as well. So yeah. because collaboration isn't there. If everybody's collaborating all the time, in theory, there shouldn't be any mistakes. Yes, absolutely. I think if you think of it, if you think of organizations as more, as more of an ecosystem, you know, if, um, if, if something isn't working or you identify something isn't working, there's a danger that you remove that thing uh, I'm going to use an analogy that may or may not not make sense because I'm kind of going with it as my brain works it through. But if you think of um, a, 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 in nature, if you take away something that doesn't seem to be working. So, for example, um, you you have birds of prey eating the, the rodents. Mm -hmm. you think, oh, no, the, the, the birds of prey are eating all the are eating all the rats. Um, or all the mice, let's go with mice, mice are slightly nicer than rats. 
so you get rid of all of the birds of prey you don't you, you don't solve a problem you just end up overrun with mice Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's a danger. Does that? I'll, I don't know where I'm going with yeah, it. I, do, I know where I'm going with the analogy. I'm just not sure mm-hmm. I'm articulating it very well. But there's a danger that we we almost sort of focus on one area without looking at potentially where other areas are going to overcompensate. Mm-hmm. If, yeah. if what what you're saying absolutely does make sense because essentially we have in nature since the beginning of time probably um, is an ecosystem. And it takes a while for an ecosystem to develop and to balance um, as well. Um, and, you know, and if there's something serious that goes on and one of those species disappears, then there's an imbalance and then it kind of rectifies it again. And within organizations, you know, people are talking about ecosystems within organizations for a while. Um, and that's, that's the same as well. So you take a component out or you change it. Um, then that ecosystem is out of balance um, and, and therefore it's, it's not going. So if you go back to a car plant, um, as an example, you know, if, if those tires aren't delivered on time, um, that then there's there's something wrong in that ecosystem. So um, and, and the production can't carry on. The cars can't roll off the the production line. So yeah, you, you're you're absolutely right. But you need that collaboration, that over that that yeah. broader view to be able to uh, to see where the the problems are interacting with each other. Yeah. So when mm-hmm. might collaboration not be a good idea then? I mean, there's there's going to be times when collaborating isn't the right thing to do despite the Mm -hmm. fact that it sounds like a a great idea when when might collaborating not be a good idea oh that's that's a tough question i wasn't really expecting that one Uh, because you know because we kind of talk ourselves all the time don't we to think about um that we should collaborate uh, but actually uh, there are times when probably we shouldn't so maybe in times i was going to say in times of crisis but often when we're in panic mode uh, we tend to not think broadly and now we're thinking narrows uh, and often that time that is the time to collaborate as you can see what was happening in government and governments and supplies now we're in time of crisis it's very easy to hunker down in times of crisis and not collaborate mm-hmm. so that's kind of co- counterintuitive I, I think i'm going to need some time to think about that oh, i'll what give you some time you and think? i'll go on to pete then thanks <laughs> <laughs> i think I, I think i think i think that's quite quite a challenging uh, quite a challenging thought process to, to, to get my head around one of the points that we were talking about with uh, with the process improvement another just a quick recommendation book recommendation following black box thinking whilst we're expanding people's minds is that Elihu gold wrap the goal which goes back to what you're talking about the fluid process so when you deal with one bottleneck it creates a further bottleneck down the right way and, that, and that's exactly what you were talking about with the birds of prey situation that mm-hmm. by fixing one problem you move on to another with regards um sort of collaboration and and not collaborating i think that the the time that i would really dissuade someone from going down a collaboration route is when you're not ready or it's not right um and the the pieces don't align correctly um to ensure that that, that can happen with a, with the right purpose um and certainly the the values need to be aligned in what we're doing mm-hmm. so um it's, it, it's almost got, going back to when we're talking about leadership or development and that the role of the leader or the line manager when learning takes place if they're not equipped and not informed of the value of what's happening, then someone can quickly become um, demotivated or disillusioned with whatever learning's taken place. They're, they've not been supported back in the work environment and that can then make that negative. And, and similarly with that mindset around collaborating, if someone's not in the right headspace for it, it's going to be counterproductive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think for me, it's about the times when it probably wouldn't be right is if there's not a clear and um agreed outcome so if you've got a whole load of different um, agencies involved in a collaboration or with their own individual agenda then i think a collaboration is completely the wrong way to go i think there has to be everybody's going to have their priority because they have their own function within that collaboration so there's going to be um potentially a, a, a um you know a, a, a risk of conflict but conflict isn't always a bad thing um mm-hmm. there's there's going to be a risk of conflict to be discussed but i think as long as the overall outcome the the the, the result that that collaboration is working towards 
is aligned. Everybody has an understanding that, you know, we talked in our first episode and we talked about this a lot when we talked, when we, when we started this collaboration is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think with any collaboration, the outcome has to be, um, it has to be more important than the individual functions within that collaboration. So Mm -hmm. I think times when it shouldn't, when collaboration maybe shouldn't be, um, the route you go down or or isn't necessarily the best route is where there is one agenda that, um, that, that is maybe so rather than it being a collaboration, really it's a sales, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's a sell. It's a, this let's get together so you can do what I want you to do as opposed to let's get together. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get Mm -hmm. together so that we can all, create something bigger than all of us um, mm-hmm. where we work together and, um, and I think you know there are pitfalls to collaboration there's always going to be power struggles there's going to be egos in there there's going to be um, potential conflict and I think if you if you don't have that clear vision of what the outcome for that project is going to be then the the, the there's a, a real t- you know danger that the project is going to fail because mm-hmm. you haven't got the buy-in um, and the drive from each of the agencies to 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 make it work. Mm. So I've had time to think now. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Um, so I think um, I think my answer is is a summary of uh, what you both have said. I think so. First of all, it is the why. To use Simon Sinek's phrase, so I always start with the why. Um, so why are we doing this? Why am I doing this? Uh, so to kind of understand uh, your level of motivation to do it and i think there needs to be some impetus in it there, there needs to be some kind of speed because if anybody's dithering around going oh i'm not sure if this is right or not well it's probably not right for at least two parties um, in that collaboration um and um, and trust um, as well i think uh, and within trust is, is a common set of values as well so if your values aren't aligned um in in any way and i I'm not necessarily talk about organizational values or you know individual businesses but on a on a human level or an individual level um, I, th- I think values need to be aligned as well because I think if you haven't got those three bases covered, uh, I think you're probably going to fail, um, and fail mm. quite quickly and possibly quite dramatically as well. Yeah, it's it, it, absolutely important to get the fundamentals aligned to ensure mm-hmm. that the collaboration works. That's that's the key thing: the vision and the goals and the objectives. Um, mm-hmm. Get those aligned. If any of those aren't there, then it it must be back to the drawing board to mm-hmm. to, to review and to ensure that the the parts that are coming together are the right parts as well. Um, but one of the things I, I did want to point out is the, the massive opportunity that I would suggest for small business um, and for medium business to collaborate with each other. Um, I think it is massively important if we have got any small business owners who sort of tune in to listen, that to, when you start out on that and, and embark on that journey for business or for your business, uh, it feels quite insular and you, you you've got a vision of what you want to achieve and actually it's quite easy to just see competitors all around you mm-hmm. and, and one of the things one of the most powerful things that I could suggest to anyone who's listening in that position is to really get out there and understand what other people do because it's whilst there's always similarities in business between offerings there's often actually an opportunity. There's an opportunity for collaboration or there's, there's something that you do that someone else doesn't do. And there's a, there's an opportunity for you to, to be able to expand your offering or to reach new people or uh, create new opportunities for yourself through collaboration. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I think um, I wrote down initially the, the, the why would collaboration be a good thing was about um, finding balance for one thing, but also filling skills gaps or knowledge gaps because nobody knows everything about everything. And there's always somebody who has the skills or knowledge that you need um, mm-hmm. and collaborating can bring that, that together and, and fill those gaps, if you like, in, in, in whatever the, 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 the skill or the knowledge might be. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Okay. I've um, nearly an hour. Do you know that? That's, that's great. <laughs> Talk for hours on this subject. I could, I, could, I could carry on, to be honest. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, <laughs> shall we carry on and then just cut it out that we didn't like so much? <laughs> well, you might I, find, you know, we might find that some of these topics does, you know, they do have huge amounts of what we could possibly do is do a bit of a, a series and, and cut them down mm-hmm. and do them over a couple of days. So, um, yeah. yeah, fantastic. I've, 
go on. I, can I just add a few things? So before coming on the call, I wrote down some, some benefits um, of collaboration. And I think this works, like Pete was saying, either whether you're a small business owner and you're a team of one or a team of 10,000 in a business. So I think, um, I think it's quite inspirational when you've got the right people or the right other organizations to, to collaborate with. Uh, because you get other people's motivation and energy. Uh, and sometimes, uh, so whether you're self-employed and you're literally by yourself, or if you're a, a senior director working in your own office, and because of your job role, you're not interacting with people necessarily. <clears throat> both can be quite lonely. Very different scenarios, very different contexts, but both can be quite lonely places sometimes. Uh, you increase your network and as well. I think you've been really educational um, because, again, it goes back you know, collaboration. You can learn and you should learn through that. Uh, what you're good at, what you're not so good at, all the things we spoke about before. Um, you know, there's opportunity for, for sales um, and all those kind of things, but it helps solve problems. Um, and I think that's the key thing that we're talking about, actually, is collaboration is there to solve a problem or problems, whatever that might be. Um, and I think you should, um, when I collaborate with the people I really want to collaborate with, it's usually quite good fun as well. Mm. So it's quite, it's quite motivating um, because, you know, collaboration should be fun. You know, whether you're working with other small businesses or large businesses. And when I'm working with people, I, I see it as a collaboration, you know, whether with you guys or with my own customers, I don't see myself being parachuted in, even if it is just for a one day thing. I like to collaborate before, during um, and, and afterwards as well. So mm -hmm. you think, you know, you think there are so many big businesses that collaborate so effectively, you know, Spotify and Uber cars, as an example, you know, there's a massive, massive global brands and they collaborate. And they do, and they've done very, very well out of it. And both their brand values, I would imagine, have have gone up. Yeah, M music and the arts. Brands. Music and the arts is another great example, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when you hybridise, when you hybridise two two different genres, you almost create a new genre, and yeah. therefore a new audience. Whilst including both audiences that you had previously, it then opens up a new audience. And must I say, whilst having fun collaborating, it was quite enjoyable seeing your need if. Oh yes, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so do you, do you know what? I am actually wearing shorts because it's it's summertime here in South Lincolnshire. So, um, oh, yeah. the joy of Zoom! You only have to you only have to worry about the waist upwards, I'm, I'm, don't you? I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to stand up. <laughs> Fortunately, I haven't got my pajamas on um, because it's after lunch. No, I'm joking. Um, and then I was thinking about uh, some some other brands that collaborate really well. So you know, you've got um, I was reading a James Bond book um, over the weekend, the original Casino Royale book. I thought, you know, Aston Martin and the James Bond franchise, they're such strong um, collaborations. Um, and obviously, you know, there's a reason why they do it, and it's because it, you know, it works, and they probably both make a huge amount of money um, out, of, out of that. And it's interesting, if you look back to the James Bond franchise, you know, the Aston Martin's there, and then sometimes it's not, and then, you know, it's there again. And, you know, there's lots of product placement and stuff in the James Bond films, that there are a lot of the large franchises. But, you know, it's a collaboration that works. And then really differently then as well, you know, a few years ago, um, A&E departments were working with Formula One um, as an example, because, you know, just to get triage right. You know, you know how quickly now these days you can get a Formula One car into the pits, get the tires changed and everything else. And it is literally seconds now. So actually, you know, A&E departments globally have learned from Formula One as an example to actually improve their processes. So sometimes collaboration doesn't come from likely pairs. It can be so very, very mm. different organizations. Mm. So... You know, but it does all the things we just said. You know, it is inspiring. Um, it is learning. Uh, it is about challenging yourselves as well. Uh, you know, because, you know, working by yourself in your same organization, your same industry, you keep on doing the same thing over and over again. You get somebody in quite differently to collaborate with and go, actually, what you're doing, we can do that better. You, you can learn from us. And I think you have to be big enough, if you like, adult enough to, to accept that there is a different way of doing it and collaboration is a really good way of doing that. So what app? app and I'll try that again. What attributes do you think, you know, at the end of the day, when we talk about businesses and organizations collaborating, in reality, you've got people collaborating. Mm -hmm. You know, you can stick the organizational title on it, but at the end of the day, it's people. It's human beings getting together in groups to, to make something happen. So what do you reckon are the key attributes for, uh, necessary for a, a healthy and successful collaboration? I think trust is the first one. That is such a big, important thing anyway. And so many people are talking about it now compared to a few years ago. So trust on, on a human level, not even on an organization level. Um, I think that's quite key. Um, I think within that, there's, there's openness, openness to be supported. Uh, because not all of us want help sometimes, but we might need it. Um, 
um, openness to being challenged, openness to having feedback. Um, I think you need to have a learning mindset as well. You need to be able to learn um, and, and challenge yourself and, and the status quo as well, um, as well as being willing to challenge other people, willing to give feedback, willing to help other people as well. It's definitely a two-way process. Yeah. Hey. Uh, yeah, so I would say shared shared benefit. So it's got to, there's got to be something, and even even if ultimately it might benefit one party more than the other, the the party who's doing the support in them, there must be uh, a motivation for them to want to help that 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 other party. Um, and so so you shared benefit, and then a shared vision. So that that needs to be aligned, uh, and they're they're the key attributes for me um, that I think are massively important and add to that from a human point of view uh, the openness open-mindedness emotional intelligence to mm -hmm. to be able to deal with the fact that it isn't just about you you know and, and often we we like to think it isn't just about us but it's it's so easily said and not easily achieved and uh, emotional intelligence is something that we're always expanding our understanding of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think for me, there's got to be a level of vulnerability. You've got to be willing to be vulnerable because, you know, otherwise you get that kind of power, you know, holding on to power and not sharing and vulnerability. I think there's, there's courage in vulnerability. You've got, you know, it takes courage to admit that um, something maybe isn't working or challenging why something's not working without, without apportioning blame. So I think, vulnerability is is one attribution i think that has to be there which is difficult and that means letting go of ego which is always going to be difficult uh, mm -hmm. but i think it can be achieved and you when you look at some of the best collaborations out there they, they've worked because there's been that level of trust that level of vulnerability but i think the key attribute in any kind of collaboration is a willingness to communicate and mm -hmm. it, it comes you know everything comes down to good communication but the willingness to communicate effectively the good and the bad and be honest about what about what's going on mm -hmm. and i think um if if you don't get that trust good communication a willingness to let go of ego right then you, you're going to end up at loggerheads there's going to be a battle somewhere down the line and it's not going to work mm -hmm. yeah mm. so we covered loads there didn't we <laughs> Whistle stop tour that. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, I'm going to put you guys on the spot now. What have you learned this week? We're, we love learning. What have you learned this week? It can be as little or as big as you like. Okay, I, I have, I've actually had a good learning today. And I, um, I sent an email to a good friend and, and colleague, someone who I've known for a long period of time, and I sent him an email with a, with a contractual agreement on there. Um, for some work that we're going to be doing and even I I thought that I had given enough preamble for him to understand why there was a contract involved and I, I the response I received was it, it was measured it was very measured in the response but it it was uh, in, it, very much in disagreement which I hadn't anticipated and that showed that showed me that even you know even my communication skill had fallen short on on that so uh good learning point for me there that was mm -hmm. Dev. okay so um this week and next week um i've uh, collaborated again with somebody actually oh, i've only ever met once uh, but we have uh, a lot of connections professional connections in common um and we are going to um hold two webinars essentially for um learning development managers heads of talent and people like that just to have a conversation about what does COVID mean for for learning uh, for training and um, things like that um, in the future and for people to just to have that conversation like we're having about kind of chew the fat there is no silver bullet at the moment nobody's been faced with this before um, and i've been toying with the idea for a while um, and it was literally just in a linkedin message just to kind of hi how are you doing I haven't seen you for a while and I said, oh, and by the way, I'm doing this. Would you be interested in co-hosting with me? And he said, yes. I thought, that's great. And then I reflected, because I like to do that more than I've ever done before. And I thought, why have I never asked anybody else to do something like this? And is it just the current situation now that we've, uh, I've found the need to do that? And then I thought, 
uh, and you get that kind of self-doubt sometimes. I thought, well, if I invite lots of people, how many will actually come? Um, so then on Friday, um, I invited lots of people. And the first session on Wednesday is already full. And the second session on the 6th of May is already full. So the learning is, oh, I think last time we mentioned about imposter syndrome a little bit as well, no matter how old you are, how professional you are, how big your network is and all those kind of things. There's that, some doubt sometimes in the back of your mind thinking, what if we ask and nobody comes? But if you don't ask, you don't get. So that's, mm-hmm. that's been my learning um, actually in, in the last week. Uh, just, just go out and, and ask. And the worst that's going to happen is people are going to say no. So that's, that's been my learning. Brilliant. Well, I'm, mine's nowhere because... near as deep and insightful as yours. I learned that actually my son makes really good pizza dough. He makes brilliant pizzas. He's 24 years old and his repertoire is pizzas. But he spent um, an hour and a half with my granddaughter, who's now, who's four, she's five next month. And the pair of them made pizza from scratch, literally kneading the dough. Ah, she thought it was brilliant. She, I, I don't know if you guys have ever made bread. But you yes, can, it, yeah. yeah, it's like mm-hmm. wallpaper paste until it all comes together. And they were having a ball. And I discovered that actually they make good pizza. I don't even like pizza. Oh my God, they make good pizza. So they've got a job now every Monday, every Monday, forever. Mm-hmm. We all have pizza. I see. Very, very shallow Me in too. my house. So, so we're, we're, we're over yours for the next recording. Well, that's not going to happen, is it? Social distancing. Plus, I don't share true. food. No, no, I don't share, food share very it. well either. Yeah. So yeah, that's, don't, that's, don't play that's well only, with others where pizza's concerned. Yeah, that's only shallow unless unless you have a deep crust, I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good. Very good. Anyway, on that note, I think it must be time to go. Uh, we've got Mental Health Month coming up in May Mm -hmm. so our next episode will be about uh, mental health issues and I think we're going to be looking at isolation and the risk of isolation and loneliness um, for for employees and businesses and business owners uh, especially pertinent at at this time isn't it so Mm -hmm. uh, we'll look forward to that and uh, I think that's us done guys okay cool speak soon bye everybody have a good week Thank you for joining us on the Stronger for Business podcast. Final thought before we go, in the words of Albert Einstein, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. Have a great week. Join us next Friday for our next episode of the Stronger for Business podcast.